Welcome to this node breakdown for Mardini 2024 with Grayscale Gorilla. This is day 13, and today's node is the RBD Material Fracture node. The RBD Material Fracture node is a sub-level geometry node. So if we dive inside here and just drop an RBD Material Fracture, we can take a geometry and plug it into first input, thus fracturing our geometry. If it's difficult to see the fracture, what you can use is an exploded view. So I'm going to just use the regular exploded view, not the RBD exploded view. So as you can see, it's broken up our geometry and it's turned it from this sort of hollow shell into something that has interior edges and faces. By default, it's going to use this material type of concrete. So this is fracturing as if this were a solid ball of concrete. The actual fracture shaping is done by this primary fracture over here. As you can see by default, it has two levels of fracturing, this level one and this tab for level two. By default, they have the same settings, but you can actually play around with the settings or even add further levels of fracturing. How it works is it creates a volume. You can see here that it says scatter from volume. So it creates a volume and it scatters points inside of that volume. The actual fog volume is affected by this noise pattern over here. So the smaller your geometry that you're trying to fracture, the higher you should go on the frequency and the resolution because you might have a situation where this noise pattern doesn't actually cover the geometry that you're trying to fracture and then you won't have any fracturing at all. So just remember to push up the frequency if you're working with a smaller geometry. So how exactly does this work? Well, it scatters points into a volume and each point becomes the center point for each piece. You can see that this cuts it up into these five pieces, one, two, three, four, five. As I increase my scatter points, you'll end up with more pieces. As you can see over here, we now have 10 pieces. You can also see this if you go over to the geometry spreadsheet, you can see it goes from piece zero to piece zero nine. So that just means that there are 10 pieces in total. If you change the scatter seed, it'll change how the points are being distributed in the volume and thus changing the way that it's fractured. Alternatively, if you don't want it to be so random, you can actually define exactly where you want these fractures to occur by using the fourth input of the RBD material fracture. So I'm going to go ahead and just use a scatter over here, setting this to 20 points, plugging the sphere in, and then just choosing an area to scatter. Now, if I plug this into fourth input, you won't notice any difference. That's because we need to tell it to use those input points. So I'm going to set our scatter points to zero and then tell it to use input points instead. If we take a look at it now, it now fractures mostly where our points are. And this is going to be useful because we can art direct using this. If we add a second level of fracturing, then we can also add that same level of randomization that we have before, which isn't dependent on this fourth input, right? So you can see a fracture one is using the input points while fracture two is just doing the scatter into the volume. The next thing that we're going to look at is adding detail to this because all of our edges are perfectly straight and we also don't have any sort of small chipping. To do that, we can use chipping right over here. If you enable it, you'll see that we end up with these tiny pieces of fractured geometry, right? So these little pieces over there, and that just adds some small detail to your fracture. All of these settings over here allow you to control the type of fracturing that you're getting on the chipping setting. I'm going to disable that again and move over to detail. Detail over here is what's going to control things like the edge shape. So if we add edge detail over here, it'll increase the resolution of our interior geometry and then add some shaping to our actual edges. We can control that over here through the noise height and noise element size. This is going to be dependent on the size of your geometry. Bigger geometries are going to need higher noise heights and higher noise element sizes. Over here, the detail size is also going to be dependent on the size of your geometry. For a smaller geometry, you're going to want smaller detail size. So as you can see, that adds even more detail. But to actually add interesting detail to the inside, we want to go down here to interior detail. When we do that, we have what looks like a much more roughed up interior, right? So this is going to be more realistic. Now, finally, at the bottom over here, we have proxy geometry. Now, proxy geometry is going to be a low resolution version of this high resolution mesh. That's what's actually going to be used for simulation. And we can see this by grabbing the last output and viewing it in our exploded view. So this is what gets simulated. So just to clarify, our solvers use this type of geometry for solving, but then it applies the transformations from this onto the high resolution geometry. So when we're looking at the settings over here for our proxies, this allows for convex decomposition, which basically shrink wraps each piece. Or we can look at packed spheres, which relates back to our vellum configure grains node, because you can see many of the same settings over here. Once again, you have things like max spheres, min radius, max radius, and a voxel size to define the resolution of the incoming geometry. So you can use this and once again, plug it into a whole grain simulation and that will work as well. We're going to keep it at the default. Finally, the other output that we need to look at are our constraints. And the constraints are going to be found over here on the final tab. 
By default, it's going to glue everything together. And if we run this into a bullet solver, you'll be able to see that this isn't actually a fractured geometry, which will break. So if I just go ahead and add a ground collision and lower it a bit and then play this back, you'll see that it doesn't actually break. That's because over here, our glue constraint primary strength is really high by default. All we have to do is just drop it to something like say 10 and now it'll fall apart, right? So you can tweak these settings until you find something that you're happy with, but this is just going to be the default glue constraint network. If you want to actually view these constraints, you can use the RBD exploded view, which is a bit different to our regular exploded view. Over here, it actually takes all three inputs and it's really useful for viewing everything, right? You can see that that white outline is actually our proxy geometry representation. And then if we say show constraints, we can actually see the constraints connecting up each piece, right? So each one of these lines is a constraint which is connecting a different piece. When a certain amount of force is applied to a constraint, then it breaks. And that's how it works in that bullet solver. So all of this is controlled by strength. And you can, of course, make changes to this strength through various other nodes. Now, just to explore the other settings, we have some examples over on the right hand side over here. I just want to show you this fracture per piece. So let's just say we have this geometry where we have a bunch of these boxes. By default, if we use the RBD material fracture, it will fracture our geometry like this. You can see that there's not many fractures going on and some pieces get more fractures than others. The way that we can correct this is by using fracture per piece. What it'll do is it'll run these operations for each and every piece of geometry. By default, it'll use connectivity. So each individual box will just be run through, but you can also use a piece prefix. So you can actually give it an attribute to run over. So when we do this, you can see that we have a much more uniform fracture. Each and every box is getting treated to the same amount of fracturing. Finally, we also have a way over here for creating other types of fractures. So if I go over here, I just have this box. It's a very thin box and it's just rotated at a bit of an angle. Over here, I have the RBD material fracture and this one has been set to glass. I'm going to recreate this so that you can understand what I'm doing here. If we use an RBD material fracture, plug it in over here and then switch this to glass, you'll see that it adds this fracture point, right? This center point over here is the source of our fracture. You can see that over here we have impact points and we can scatter points to increase the number of those fracture points. The thing is, sometimes you don't want that and you'd rather use some input points. So over here, I have an add node and we plug that into the fourth input. And what it'll do is it'll add a fracture wherever we define. So using this add node, you can actually just move points around and define exactly where you want your fracture to occur. Once again, we have access to things like cracks. When we look at radial cracks, these are the ones that are stemming from the center. So it's these ones that move in straight lines outwards. Then we have the concentric cracks, which are going to be these rings of cracks. And we can actually adjust the strength for each one over under the constraints tab. You'll see we have radial strength and concentric strength. Once again, radial strength are these straight lines heading out and concentric strength is for these rings of fracturing. Realistically, radial fractures are going to be weaker than concentric fractures. And that's why we have a difference in radial and concentric strength. So a good idea is to keep this ratio between these two. So if we're going to drop this to a radial strength of say five, then keep your concentric strength to something like 20, right? So more or less four times whatever your radial strength is going to be. Now, of course, this is going to vary depending on the type of glass, but basically radial strength is going to be lower than concentric strength. An extremely useful node to use with glass is the RBD connected faces. The only thing that you have to do is disable create constraints because if you don't, it'll override the constraints coming from your RBD material fracture. What this does is it checks the distance between different edges and we can use that information later on to delete any faces that are too close together. So what does this look like? Well, over here, I just have an RBD bullet solver and then we have this RBD disconnected faces. What you'll want to do is set the mode to delete connected with a fairly low distance threshold. What this will do is it'll give you a fused glass. So let me just show you what that looks like. If we take a look at the unfused one and switch to wireframe, right? So you can see over here that that over there is an interior face. In the fused glass, that doesn't exist. And I can show you this in an exploded view as well. You can see that these interior faces have been removed compared to when we have the fused glass, it still has those interior faces. What is this going to do? Well, this is going to be important for when we render. So if I just go over to the stage level, we just have this piece of glass. This is the fused one. And then we have the unfused one over here. You can see that this one, you can actually see where the fractures are before it's even broken. So that's why we use that RBD disconnected faces. You can see that the unfused one is fracturing before it actually breaks. But this one over here is still together. 
right? So that's just something to keep in mind. RBD connected faces and RBD disconnected faces are going to be really useful when working with the glass material type. Finally, we do also have the wood type over here. So material type of wood. And you'll see that this gives you some different settings, but really all of these are just for controlling the look of the wood. The only thing that might be interesting for you is this over here where we switch to self constraints when broken. This is going to be useful for ensuring that the wood doesn't break as a rigid body. Wood has a bit of a bend to it. So when we enable this, our constraints will still hold together, but not perfectly, right? So this is a soft constraint. It's useful for when working with wood. So that's all we're really gonna look at in this video. Basically, the RBD material fracture is just your go-to node for fracturing up geometries, whether they be single geometries, sets of geometries, or different types of materials. There's going to be loads and loads of different nodes that you use with it, and it's going to be incredibly useful for all sorts of rigid body simulations. That's all for this video though, and I'll be seeing you tomorrow with the Cloud Shape Generates Up. So thanks for watching, until then, bye.